Hi everyone and welcome to Night School. I'm Lynn. And I'm Christina. And we're part of the nightlife team at Cal Academy in San Francisco. Uh, for those of you that don't know about nightlife or night school, um, nightlife is our weekly Thursday night events where we mix science with some live music and cocktails. Uh, while we don't have cocktails easily accessible for you, uh, we are sending a little nightlife to you at home in the form of night school. Um, Christina and I will be here with a new theme and some friends every Thursday night. Um, and this week we are exploring the great, great whale, gray whale migration. And um, I also want to thank, uh, thank our colleague behind the scenes, Richie, for getting, you, there might, you might be seeing a lot of bots right now. Don't worry, we will clear those up. They eventually go away. I know they're distracting. Um, anyway, but uh, yeah, tonight is really exciting. And you can kind of, you can kind of follow along if you, if you get out, you know, you're like go to Google Maps and um, follow along the West Coast. We're going to kind of be following the whale migration up the coast, kind of. Um, but first off, we have Mo Flannery uh, making her record third night school mm -hmm. appearance. And from a separate, like, she's always coming from a collections, um, from inside the collections at the Academy. And so tonight she's coming from Mimology. Um, and she's an important part of the Marine Mammal Stranding Network. And she's gonna talk about why it's important to house spe specimens from stranded whales in museum collections and what can be um, done and found out from them. Um, and then we're kind of, we're going south down to Baja, California, kind of starting in the winter. Um, gray whales spend their time in lagoons in Baja to give birth and raise their calves there. And Steven Swartz is the co-director and founder of Laguna San Ignacio Ecosystem Science Program. And he'll talk about how his team is helping to protect these critical areas and manage ecotourism there. Um, heading up north uh, to Puget Sound, where John Kalimbokides of the Cascadia Research Collective will talk about the status of whales in Washington State, along with the story of a unique group of whales that return annually to Puget Sound to feed. And then finally, Barbie Halaska is the necropsy manager at the Marine Mammal Center, and she'll talk about studying scientific information from stranded gray whales to determine more about the feeding habits to determine more about their feeding habits, um, about when they reach the Arctic, and also how you can tell the overall health of the Arctic ecosystem they rely on. So it's a lot. It's going to be a great night. <laughs> that is a lot. Um, as always, <laughs> tonight's program is live. So say hi in the chat. Continue to let us know where you're watching from. Uh, let us know if it's your first time joining us or if you been a night school regular. If you are a night school regular, let us know how many times you've been with us. Um, we're, we're just taking a casual poll. Um, we'll have Q and A's after each talk. So make sure to add any questions you have in the comments. Um, and with that, we will pass it off to Mo. Hi everyone. You can hear me fine, I assume. I'm Mo Flannery. I am the Senior Collections Manager of Birds and Mammals here at the California Academy of Sciences. And I'm currently in our main collection room that houses our bird specimens, which are study skins, skeletons, and eggs and nests, and then some large mammal specimens, which also includes some of our whale specimens. And behind me, just so that you're not wondering through the whole thing, there's a, a hornbill, a gray horned owl, a pelican, and an African elephant back there with a few birds. So we, that's out of the way. So I'm gonna talk to you a little bit more. One of my great loves as part of my job is that I get to work on large whale stranding response here at the Academy of Sciences. And Barbie and I work together in the Bay Area to lead what's called a necropsy on uh, any large whale that washes up along the coast. The academy teams with the Marine Mammal Center, so we have a large group of people to go out and investigate why these whales have died. So a necropsy is basically um, the, the same thing as an autopsy except for an animal. So when you open up an animal to try and figure out how it died, that's called a necropsy. So I'm gonna share with you my presentation on explaining a little bit of what we do and what's been going on for the past couple of years here in the San Francisco Bay Area. So 
The Academy, the collection that I'm in right now, houses 100,000 bird specimens, 32,000 mammal specimens, and 11,000 eggs and nests. And the specimens that I take care of range in size from a teeny tiny hummingbird egg, which is like a, a half an inch long, to an 87 blue whale skeleton that's on display up on our main exhibit floor. So we have all sorts of different types of specimens in the collection, bones, pelts, baleen, uh, whole skeletons, partial skeletons, mounted animals like the birds you saw be see behind me. And those specimens are used by researchers from all over the world. So basically I'm a librarian, but instead of managing books and sending books out to people or having visitors come here and look at my books, they're coming and looking at all of the specimens that I take care of, or I'm sending those specimens on loan to them. And they can ask all sorts of questions, things like looking at the morphology of the animals, the data that goes with the specimens tells you about geographic distribution. There's lots of individual variations. Archaeologists will be doing digs and they need to identify bones, so they bring them in here. And that's how they uh, confirm their identifications. All of this work, especially work from specimens in the past, and hopefully those in the future, can help scientists learn more about climate change and environmental contaminants. And currently, researchers do many more studies than they did 100 years ago, looking at DNA and stable isotopes and CT scans. We have tons of technology. But 100 years from now, there might even be other technologies so it's my job to make sure all these specimens are here in the future for researchers to work with and for them to work with now. So in our mammal collection of those 32,000 specimens, over 6,500 catalogs, we have a huge backlog of things that we still have to catalog. Over 6,500 of those are marine mammal specimens. We have the world's largest collection of California sea lion specimens over 3,000 individual specimens of California sea lions, and the world's largest collection of southern sea otters. But overall, the marine mammal collection represents 49 different species of cetaceans and pinnipeds, so seals, sea lions, and uh, whales, dolphins, and porpoises. Over 185 researchers have used the collection to date and have published more than 70 scientific publications. In fact, 71 because I got another publication today from a researcher who used our collection in his work. So typically when we respond to a large whale, we don't always collect the entire skeleton um, or uh, the entire whale itself because it's too big and we don't have enough space. So we'll go for certain bones and tissues when we're working on a large whale We'll collect pelvic bones, we'll collect baleen, which this black um, photo, this photo is of uh, blue whale baleen, that's a section of blue whale baleen, numerous plates. We collect tissues, blubber samples, Barbie's gonna talk more about what, what researchers do with blubber samples, earplugs, which I have yet to find an earplug. Maybe someday John can teach me how to find an earplug because I'm still working on trying to get them, I think they're just badly decomposed by the time they get to us. We collect skin samples and parasites, things like barnacles and whale lice, which I'll show you some of later. And those specimens are all used by researchers. Now, marine mammals are protected under the Marine Mammal Protection Act. They've been protected since 1972. That covers all marine mammals, but many of them are also protected under the Endangered Species Act. But uh, us here at the California Academy of Sciences and other organizations are authorized by the National Marine Fisheries Service through a stranding agreement to work on these animals. So we have special permission to respond to marine mammals, stranded marine mammals. So the Marine Mammal Stranding Network is a nationwide network here in the United States with over 120 organizations along all the coasts. There are one national coordinator, six regional coordinators, and five different geographic regions. California is in the West Coast region along with Washington and Oregon. The Academy responds to dead marine mammals. 
along this section of coastline. It's 400 miles of coast and bay shoreline. We cover 10 different counties, and we go from Año Nuevo Island in San Mateo County all the way up to Westport in Mendocino County. So we respond to dead marine mammals in this one area, and the Marine Mammal Center responds to live marine mammals in the same area, plus also in an extended area of California. But when it comes to live whales, we all work to, I mean, sorry, dead whales. <laughs> I wish I got to work on live whales, but when it comes to dead whales, we work very closely with the Marine Mammal Center to try and uh, determine what happened to them when they die. So we're looking for things like signs of human interactions with fisheries or bycatch, whether they've ingested gears, if they've been entangled in fishing gear, whether they were hit by a vessel, and if there are signs of disease. We also work with the Marine Mammal Center on some small cetacean CT scan projects. And then if they have special specimens from their uh, rehab that had cancer and thus died, we archive those specimens into our collection here as well. But the really, uh, the collaboration with Barbie and her team is really uh, the best. So in uh, March, April of 2019, all of the stranding organizations along the West Coast, including the folks in Mexico, saw a record number of gray whales washing up dead along the coast. And we alerted the National Marine Fisheries Service that something was going on. And in May of that year, NOAA, declared uh, what's called an unusual mortality event. And we'll refer to it probably as a UME throughout this talk. So a, a UME is defined as unexpected strandings that involve a significant die off of a marine mammal population, in this case, gray whales, that demands an immediate response to figure out what's going on. So once NOAA declared the UME, it actually dated all the way back to January of 2019 because gray whales were dying then as well. A whole investigative team was put together and a working group team from organizations all along the West Coast, from Mexico, the continental US, Canada, and Alaska. And since 2019, we've all been working together to both examine the whales on the beach and to do subsequent testing to try and figure out what's happening to these whales and why they might be dying. So as part of the UME, um, Southwest Fisheries Science Center, I'll go back to this one for a second. They completed a population estimate for the Eastern Pacific gray whales. And they realized that the number of gray whales migrating along the West Coast has dropped 24% to about 20,000 whales since the last time they did the population assessment, which was back in 2015 and 2016. And at, at that point, the gray whale population was estimated to be at about 27,000. So in 2019, we, we saw way more than the average annual death. So here's what the numbers look like in 2019. From Mexico to Canada, there were 214 dead gray whales. For the 18 years prior to 2019, the annual average number of gray whale strandings was 29 per year. So you can see 214 was really kind of a shocking number. However, we all remembered uh, or knew about a situation in 1999 and 2000, so 20 years earlier a very similar situation happened and another UME was declared back then. They had over the total of those two years, I believe it was 600 dead gray whales in 1999 and 2000. So this was a very similar um, situation showing up. And you can see the numbers by country and then you can also see by US state and to date this year, uh, right now we're at four for the U.S. and Mexico has had uh, 32 so far in 2021. So we're hoping that we're kind of on the waning end of this unusual mortality event, that the peak was in 2019, 2020 was a little bit lower, and hopefully this year it'll be less. 
So here you can just see kind of the distribution of the dead gray whales. Uh, 2020 is in red, 2019 is in purple, and 2018 is in blue, but you don't see very many blue there because 2018 was kind of an average year, so there weren't very many dead whales. But you can see just the range and the extent of the number of gray whales that had wa have washed up in 2019 and 2020 along the coast. And in the bar graph too, the, um, the dark bar is the 18 year average. So you can see May of 2019 was way up over between 25 and 30 stranded whales in just that month compared to the 18 year average of five. So something was definitely and is still definitely going on. So if we compare 2019 to 2021 with 1999 and 2000, you can see that the, the shape of the bars is very similar. Um, and in fact, uh, the orange is 2019, the two blues are 1999 and 2000, and the green is 2020. So you can see the very similar patterns through the month. So we're in March right now. Uh, March is kind of a slow month as far as strandings go, according to this graph. Um, things will pick up in April and May and June, and hopefully they won't be as bad this year. So by this date of May 20, March 23rd, this is, these data are from a couple of days ago. In 2019, there were 74 dead uh, gray whales. And in 2020, there were 72. And like I said, so far this year, we've had about 40 total. So it's looking a little bit better. So from the gray whale, um, so this UME resembles the 1999 and the 2000 UME. And back in 1999 and 2000, they also saw a 23% decline in the number of gray whales after the unusual mortality event. So I mentioned 24% was the calculated by Southwest Fisheries recently. In back in 1999 and 2000, it was about 23% of decline. But the gray whale population obviously rebounded. So their population declined after the UME then, and then it got back up to 27,000 in 2015 and 2016. So what this suggests, and this is what uh, NOAA fisheries scientists put out a technical memorandum and they say that it suggests that the large scale fluctuations like this are not rare, that they may be a natural occurrence, and that the observed decline in abundance appear to represent short-term events that have not resulted in any detectable longer-term impacts on the population, at least longer-term impacts that we've seen yet. But why, why are they experiencing these declines? So that's one of the questions that the, the investigative team is trying to ask and trying to answer. So here's 2019, these are some of the whales that Cal Academy and the Marine Mammal Center responded to. In the San Francisco Bay Area in 2019, we had 14 dead gray whales. Seven of them showed signs of malnutrition. Four showed that they had been hit by ships. One was ship strike and malnutrition, and two were unknown. And then in 2020, just a smattering of dead gray whales in the Bay Area, we had six and one was trauma, probably orca, one was a premature birth, one was possible malnutrition, and the other three were unknown. So 2020 was kind of tricky because of COVID, so we weren't able to examine as many whales as we would have in previous years. But the preliminary findings of the unusual mortality event investigative team shows that several of the whales have shown evidence of emaciation but these findings are not consistent across all of the whales examined. So the team needs to do more research and that's why the unusual mortality event is continuing through 2021. Uh, so all the folks on the call today or on the uh, presentation tonight are involved in the unusual mortality event and work with gray whales. 
and um, have experience in this, and we'll share some of that with you. But I want to show you some specimens that we collected from the unusual mortality event event before we move on, if I still have a little bit of time. And so, if you do you still have the camera, Christina? Okay. So really quickly, I'm going to just explain some of the samples that we collect and that are housed in the collection. So this is a pelvic bone from an adult male gray whale. In fact, it was one of the ones from 2019. So this is an easy bone to take off the beach. It's pretty easy to find in the body of the whale. And we always want to archive at least one bone from an animal in the museum collection that because that shows that animal at that place of time um, in the collection. The lighting is really bright, huh? This is also an ear bone. Uh, researchers can study the ear bones. This is from that same male, and they can study the age of the animal from the ear bone. This is baleen, and some of the folks might explain how gray whales feed using their baleens. And I, so I wanted to give you a picture of what baleen looks like. So if, if it was in the mouth of the whale, we would, so say we're looking at the whale at their cheek, this, these um, sections of baleen, sorry, I can't point and hold the camera. These sections of baleen here are next to their cheek, so on the outer side of their mouth. And on the inside of their mouth, the baleen is all frayed like this. And it acts as a sieve. So when gray whales suction food into their mouth, then they squeeze out the water and the food stays in their baleen like a sieve. And then you may see some pictures of gray whales with some parasites. So they can get barnacles on them, on their skin. So here's a skin sample with some barnacles. And then you can see floating around in the bottom of this jar. Those are whale lice. They're actually a copepod. They're called cyamids or cyamids, depending on how you say it. And they can sometimes be found on especially um, very emaciated and sick whales. Well, they'll get full of cyamids on the outside. They just attach on in various places. So you may see some pictures of some whale life too. So I wanted to give you a view of that. So Barbie will explain to you some of the research that um, she's doing with some samples, with blubber samples from gray whales. And hopefully as time moves on and, the, and researchers this year get gather more data from any dead whales that wash up We'll get tissues, hopefully, and we'll learn more about why gray whales are dying along the West Coast. So maybe we have some time for questions. Hi, Mo. We do have Hi time there. for questions. Okay. Uh, I feel like it went a little bit long, but that's, fine. that's okay. We have time for some questions. Um, okay. First question. Um, how many yep. team members does it take for you all to inspect a beached gray whale? And does each person have a different role? Yes. So um, I like to say that I, my team from Cal Academy, we're the specialists in the bones. And Barbie's team from the Marine Mammal Center is really good at the tissues and the organs. So we all will we'll have a safety um, meeting before we get started every time. Usually on a gray whale, if it's a small gray whale, we might have six people. I'm having a hard time remembering because COVID, we could only have a very small team, yeah. but we would try to get, you know, six to 10 people, but on like a 30 foot adult whale, usually we're fighting with the tides. We have a very mm -hmm. short window of time that we can get the necropsy done and you have to open up the whole animal because if an animal is hit by a ship, you don't see really any signs on the outside that are that obvious. You really have to get inside. So uh, my team tries to get into all the bones to check all the bones and see if they're broken. And Barbie's team goes in and gets tissue samples and looks for signs of disease and 
reproductive organs and whether if it was a female, if she was pregnant. And so we all work together and we all have our specific jobs. I have one team of two people that go for the pelvic bones and one person that goes for the ear bones, always looking for the earplug. But like I said, we're not, we're not great at finding them. Other people around the world are much better at it. But so it's a, it's a big group. It's a big team working together and being very careful. Unfortunately, on the West Coast, we can't use heavy machinery. On the East Coast, they have a lot more beach access so they can get like big backhoes and things down to help them work on a whale. We have to do it all by hand with knives and gaffers and pulling blubber off and stuff. So. And it doesn't smell that bad. If anyone's gonna ask about the, <laughs> the smell, I mean, it does smell bad, but it's not a smell that it doesn't make you sick or anything. It's just the way the dead whale smells. You get used to it. Surprisingly, there are no questions on the smell yet, um, but okay. there is on well, how long on um, how long does it take on average? We probably only have three or four hours to get the work done. Um, we often can work on Angel Island. So a lot of the whales in the San Francisco Bay Area have been found floating inside San Francisco Bay. And in fact, if you're out on the water, be careful because there are whales using San Francisco Bay right now. There's some gray whales out there. There's a humpback whale out there. Um, but if a whale is inside San Francisco Bay, we have it towed to Angel Island. There's a small beach that's not accessible by land. We And we have permission from state parks to work out there. but we have a certain time we can land the boat and land up and then we work yeah. on the whale and then we have to get off the island before the tide gets too high so it usually is about three hours maybe four at the most that we have to work on one it doesn't seem like a lot of time it's not a lot of time it's very yeah. quick um how many do you estimate die but don't wash ashore john might be able to give you more information about that. I think what I've read, at least with blue whales, is that the, I think we only might see 10% of the animals that die. But John oh, can wow. confirm that because I think he knows more about that than I do. Okay. We'll ask that again to John. Yeah. Um, there are questions about volunteering to be on a team. Is that possible? Yes. You can send me an email if you have a, um, a biology background. That's one of the requirements. And we do ask people to commit some time to our laboratory work before we put them on our large whale necropsy team. So they have to prove themselves with the stinky specimens in the lab before we take them out on large whales. So if you think you might be up for that, um, we're not taking new volunteers now because of COVID because we're not really open yet. Um, so we're not having volunteers come into the museum, but maybe in the next six months or so, we'll be able to bring more people on board. Uh, so just apply through the volunteer website and drop me an email if you're qualified. Um, and then one last question. I don't know if this is a fun one, but you did mention earplugs and we have a question yes. about what is an earplug? So, uh, so an nice earplug, yeah. So whales, just like humans, lay down wax in their ears, only their stays in there, it doesn't come out. And so it lays down over years. So one of the cool things I didn't talk about, have time to talk about is researchers can study the earplugs. They can figure out how old the whale was by looking at the different layers of earplugs. They can also analyze those different layers and it tells them um, hormone levels and stable isotopes. And you can look at what they, if they had uh, contaminants and things through the earplug. Same thing with baleen. Um, researchers, not some, gray whale baleen is, doesn't last as long or as many, doesn't sh have as many years of growth in it as other whales, but you can take a tiny sample of baleen and it can tell you what the animal was feeding or where it was feeding in the ocean during that growth period. And you can also look at hormone levels. So it's a female, it, if it's a female, it'll tell you when she was pregnant and when she went through stress and things. And John has also done some research on 
um, earplugs and baleen too, which he may talk about if he doesn't have time. You can learn more about that elsewhere, but it's very informative. Cool. Um, well, thank you so much, Mo, as always, for joining us. Um, up next, we have Stephen Schwartz. Sorry, if you hear scratching noises, it is my dog trying to get out of my room. Um, but up next, we have Stephen, who will talk more about, um, sorry, now I'm losing track, um, about his time in Baja, California. Well, thank you very much. And I'd like to say good evening to everyone. Um, I'm on the East Coast, so I've had my dinner. And I hope uh, hope you're having something to snack on or to sip on while you're watching this fantastic program. My compliments and thanks very, very much from me and from our whole team uh, to Cal Academy and the, and the Night School gang for, uh, for giving us this opportunity to talk with you about our uh, programs in Baja California and what we've been seeing relative to um, the UME, but also just gray whales in general. So we call ourselves the Laguna San Ignacio Ecosystem Science Program. And uh, I need to type and hide this little bar. No, that happens when I do that. And we'll start it again. Okay. Can you see the screen okay? Yeah, we're good now. Okay, good, good. So uh, Mary Lou Jones and I did the first uh, uh, science scientific documentation of gray whales in Laguna San Ignacio in Baja California between 1977 and 82. There was then a hiatus uh, where our, our, our co-director, uh, Jorge Arban of the Autonomous University of Baja California Sur uh, resumed those studies in 1995 to 2003. And in 2006, we started what was now known as the Ecosystem Science Program at Laguna San Ignacio. And we are a project of the Ocean Foundation. It's a Washington, D.C. based a nonprofit. So the project uh, in, intends to provide uh, science-based information on the status of gray whales and other marine life that, that occupy the Laguna San Ignacio and Bahia Magdalena uh, uh, lagoon systems. We also are trained new generations of marine scientists and conservationists so they can get a taste of what it's like to do actual applied marine science. And then all of our information we believe is directed to educate and empower the public and local residents. And to that effect, here's some of our workforce. We support uh, graduate level uh, researchers from universities in Mexico and elsewhere for three months of field work each winter and then three months of analysis and reporting at the end. Uh, this is all part of their master's and or PhD uh, research program at their universities. Now, everyone's pretty much familiar with gray whales, but I'll do a quick overview of, uh, of, of their distribution. On the eastern North Pacific side, we have about 21,000 or more individuals, and they range from uh, south of Baja California and the Gulf of California all the way up the uh, North American coast in the uh, Arctic uh, and, and so on. On the West side, we have a smaller group called the Western North Pacific population that has been photo identified to uh, at least at one point had as, as many as 250 individuals. So it's much, much smaller. Uh, there is a zone where both the populations mix here off of the Kamchatka Peninsula um, and up into the, up into the uh, Northern Bering Sea area. John's gonna be talking about a subgroup in this larger Eastern North Pacific population called the Northwest Pacific Feeding Group. So there's a a look at, at uh, the distribution. Now, we talked about this migration where these stranded whales are coming ashore. Each, uh, each spring, the whales migrate from their southern breeding ranges off of Baja California and Southern California to the north uh, uh, through the Aleutian chain and they fan out over the broad continental shelf uh, seeking food and along the shore shoreline of the Asian shelf uh, to feed for the summer, for the, the time that it's uh, daylight and the weather's pretty good and the production of, of food is high. In the winter that reverses as the days get shorter and shorter and the conditions get colder and colder and icier and stormier, uh, the gray whales uh, funnel back out of their northern feeding range and reverse their migration and go south uh, down the North American coast. It's interesting that uh, we'll talk more about this. The strandings during the UME occur during the spring northward migration and not so much during the return to the winter breeding range off of Baja California. In Mexico, they are three destinations. Uh, 
uh, aggregation and breeding areas in these coastal lagoons. The largest is Laguna, Laguna Ojo de Liebre in the north. In the middle is Laguna San Ignacio, where we have our program based. And then Bahia Magdalena complex, several bays down there and estuaries, uh, which we also collect uh, information on the gray whales in that southernmost area. Oops. Um, we do boat surveys to keep track of how many whales are in the lagoon and their distribution in Laguna San Ignacio each year. This is a GPS track that we follow. Have been doing it since 1977 when Mary Lou and I set up that survey route. And it tells us interesting things about the whales. If we look here at this, at this example, we have January 15th at the lower left-hand side of the axis running all the way to April. It didn't like that. All the way to April uh, on the right-hand side of the axis. And you can see that um, this gives us information about the arrival times of the whales. This particular graph shows 2016 to 2021. So we can see there's a shift uh, in recent years of a later arrival at the lagoons. It also gives us uh, a way to compare the high counts or the most number of whales that seem to use San Ignacio Lagoon each winter. And then of course, it also allows us to look at departure times. And we see when it when the, when the clock is up, it's, they all seem to exit at about the right time, except in 2016. And I've got to go back and see what the deal was with 2016. The other most powerful tool we use is photographic identification. This gives us information on the duration of stay of whales in the breeding lagoons, uh, fidelity, who's coming back each year, calving interval, if it's a breeding female, when she has a calf, when she does not, and movement among areas and minimum age. And a couple of quick examples. Here's a female that was first sighted uh, in 1977 with a calf. So she know, we know she was a breeding female and she was most recently sighted in 2019. Well, if you do some quick math, uh, there are 42 years between the first and the most recent sightings. And if she was six to eight years old uh, with a calf able to breed, we're looking at an animal that's 48 to 50 years old and she's still returning to Laguna San Ignacio uh, as a single to breed or with a calf uh, continuously. Movement between Western and Eastern North Pacific populations were demonstrated again using photo ID. First Bruce mate tagged some whales uh, on the uh, Western side and they uh, were supposed to go to China to show us where the breeding grounds are there. Instead, they all went to North America, across the Aleutian chain, hooked up with the Eastern population and showed up in Baja California during the breeding season. So we followed up with extensive photo ID comparisons. And you know, uh, as of 2018, there are 51 individuals that have been photographically matched between uh, the Eastern and Western uh, sides of the Pacific, showing a mixing of these two groups. And 11 of those are, are breeding females. Well, Mo's already given us the background on the unusual mortality event that began in 2019 and is continuing to this day. Um, she showed this graphic here. It shows you that the event is affecting animals during the spring, my, spring and summer migration from their southernmost part of their range in Mexico all the way up to uh, their Alaskan range uh, and into the Arctic seas. Um, she also showed you this figure comparing it to the 18 year average. So we know that this has been a severe event. Uh, when this happens, the NOAA establishes the UME uh, uh, investigation working group and so on. What I'd like to point out is some of the observations we saw in Laguna, in Laguna San Ignacio and Bahia Magdalena leading up to the present UME, specifically low calf counts in, in three running years and again this year, and then an increased number of skinny or emaciated whales. Here's what got our attention. If you look at the top figures, we could see that uh, typical counts before 2018, you know, in, in the middle of the season, mid-February, early March, it was not unusual to find, you know, 75, 80, or as high as 100 or even more uh, mother calf pairs in Laguna San Ignacio. In 2018, that changed. That's the blue line at the bottom of the screen. And I'll try to point to it without changing the slide. There we go. Uh, in 2018, the number hovered around 20. In the following three years, 2019, 2020, and 2021, again this year, uh, the mother calf count pair, mother calf pair counts are extremely very, very low, suggesting that there's been a, a, a significant decline in the reproductive rate of the animals. There's the 20 calf pair count line, and we also noticed a change in the condition of the animals, what appeared to be. So one of our researchers, Irandi Calderon, started analyzing the photographic identification data. And then that was followed on by Flora Rezon and uh, Sergio Martinez, who looked at the photographic identification data from 2018 to 2021. 
And what they were doing was evaluating the condition of the animal based on photo ID, uh, digital photographs, looking at the postcranial area, uh, the dorsal flank, and the scapular area above the, uh, the, the, uh, the flipper. Uh, this procedure was developed by Amanda Bradford and again with David Weller, and they used it initially just to evaluate the condition of the Western gray whales. And we adopted it for looking at the Eastern gray whales. Uh, what they do is they look at those three areas, the head, the scapula, and the flank, and they assign a numerical score. If it's in good condition, it gets a three. If it's in average condition or fair condition, it's a two. And if it's in emaciated or skinny condition, it gets a one. And so they were able to cal uh, calculate uh, uh, an index like this to, to categorize these animals. Here's an example of a, a normal gray whale following the summer feeding. When we see them in the winter, this should be the fattest time of the year for them. Got a nice smooth a contour of the back behind the head and a rounded uh, convex uh, flank. Uh, acceptable is where you know they don't feed extensively during the winter when they're in Mexico, so we'd expect them to lose some weight, and so we start to see uh, the scapula showing up here, but this is an acceptable whale. It's not too thin, a little bit of depression behind the head, again, not serious, and a little flattening of the, of the flank area. But what happens when we get emaciated, we see something like this. Now, let me point out what we're looking at here. This whale is swimming away from us on its uh, left side. So here are the top of the blowholes. Its eye is protruding out here. This big bulge here is the base of the skull. All of the body tissue and fat that was normally behind the skull leading to the trunk of the, of the animal is, is gone, is missing. Uh, the dorsal uh, spinal column, is very, very visible. And instead of a convex curve to the back, it's very, very concave. This bulging is the abdominal cavity and those are the internal organs uh, that are bulging out. Here's the, another example of, of that um, skinny whale. Here's the eye of the whale right here. Uh, the blowholes are up here on the top and you can see where a normal healthy whale would have tissue all in here, the smooth transition, it's missing. And so the skull is very predominant. Uh, you can see the ridge pretty much in this picture of the scapula, the dorsal uh, edge of the scapula is sticking up. And again, that uh, predominant spinal column showing because uh, there's uh, no tissue. Here's an example of that spinal column on the flanks, uh, the, the concave look at the flanks. So here's what uh, Irandi and, uh, and Flor and Sergio discovered that between 19, uh, excuse me, 2008, 2009, 2010, and 2011, we saw an increase in the fair condition and uh, not a really major increase or change in the uh, poor condition. It, rained, it, it hovered around 6.5% of the whales that we were photographing. However, in 2018, when we started seeing uh, more of uh, skinny whales and low, low calf counts, uh, we started tracking again, and we saw that in 2019, which is the year the stranding event, the UME began, uh, we saw an increase of the uh, poor condition from 8.2% in the previous year to 23%. And um, then again in 2020, a continuing increase up to 30% of the whales we're seeing look skinny, poor condition, or emaciated one degree or another. This year, although we won't know the final numbers, we're averaging about 18% of the whales are looking like they're in poor condition. So this is a heads up that something was wrong. Simil similarly, uh, we saw this, the trend in Bahia Magdalena in those three years, 2018, we went from 24% to 40% in 2000. 19 and 38% in 2020. We don't have the numbers yet for this year. So the numerical scoring was okay, but it can be a bit subjective because you're working from photographs and trying to score these body features. So we brought in the drones. We were fortunate we had two colleagues, Frederick Christensen and Lars Bader, who developed a method to look at right whale calf and mother uh, growth and shrinkage rates in Australia with the southern right whales and then again with humpbacks. And so We've partnered with them and brought the technology to Laguna San Ignacio, where we trained a couple more pilots, uh, Fabian Rodriguez and Fabian Vivetier, who are fondly known as Fabian Uno from Mexico and Fabian Du from France. And this is the type of imagery that they look at. Again, you can see on the top is a, a classic healthy looking whale with this nice curved fat, you know, uh, streamlined shape. Whereas a skinny whale, uh, you can see the predominant uh, spinal column showing up here, the concave flanks, the swelling of the abdominal cavity, uh, the edge of the scapula sticking up on each side above the flippers, which are right here and down here. And the skull's not 
quite that visible in this photograph because we're on top of the whale looking down, but that's that depression behind the skull where they've lost their weight. So what we've been able to do with the uh, photography is to divide uh, the uh, high density photographs, vis uh, video photographs, taking still images and dividing the whale up into 5% sections and then doing some simple geometry. We can, we can estimate the uh, body mass of the animal over time. First time we see it and then we re repeatedly photograph it during the three month season. We can see obviously as the calves grow, as their moms shrink, uh, but we can also evaluate body condition. So we did that for the three years that we had the, the data for. We recently published the paper on poor body condition. It was published this past January. And here's what we found. Uh, these are plots of body volume uh, on the left axis and total body length against total body length on the lower axis. The black line in the middle is average condition for all of the samples combined. The red are, are calves. And we notice that uh, where they start out kind of small and then they get better as they grow in the three months. The green are uh, the juvenile whales, uh, and the uh, adults are the gray dots, and then the blue are the lactating females, or the moms of the calves. If we put this on a log axis or transformation, you can see that the calves, obviously their condition improves. We see more of them as, as the season goes along because they're getting fat and growing very, very fast. However, the juveniles um, seem to be uh, below, always skinny, the ones that we were able to, uh, to identify. We've got a few normal... Uh, fatter ones up here. We also had a predominance of uh, normal mothers with calves, but then it covered up, uh, the blue covers up the gray here, but there was a, a predominance of uh, uh, single adults uh, that were below the average um, uh, 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 condition index. So here's how this sort of plays out. Uh, we'll look at calves first. We can see when they're born, uh, the gray is 2017. This is when the season starts. They're about average condition, uh, but they get fatter. So their condition improves or it improved all three years, 2017, 18, and 19. Their moms over here on the right uh, went the other way because they're shrinking now. They're converting their body fat into milk for their calves. So their body condition all three years declined down to somewhere around near the average or uh, 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 condition index. Juveniles, on the other hand, came into the winter breeding range already at the, uh, the average body condition, and their condition just declined as the winter moved, winters moved along. And the same with the adults. They came in uh, you know, with a above average body condition, but their body condition changed and went down into the negative uh, zone as the season, the three month season progressed. These two red dotted lines at the bottom are uh, measurements, condition measurements from uh, stranded dead whales, and you can show you that if, if things don't improve, these trends are heading these other whales toward the, where we're seeing the condition of a lot of the stranded whales. So what'll, what's going to become of, 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 of the deer gray whales? Well, as Mo also uh, pointed out, the history of the gray whale population, and this is the NOAA uh, census work since uh, 1968 to 2020, the history of the population shows these oscillations, uh, you know, increases, then a decline, and followed by an increase. Uh, then they do okay, then they reach another peak, and then they decline, and then they seem to recover. Here's the turn of the century UME, the 1999 to 2000 UME resulted in a decline, but then the whales seem to be recovering from that up until, uh, you know, 2015, 2016. Uh, but then they declined again with the current UME that began in 2019 and 2020. Um, only time will tell where it goes from here. But we can see that they make these oscillations. So what, what causes um, the UME and, and what causes these periodic population declines? Well, we consider a number of different things. Ship strikes are one possibility and collisions between gray whales and ships do occur but not, a, not frequent enough to cause uh, the, the stranding le re levels that we see in the UME. Uh, gray whales also, because they're coastal, become entangled in fishing gear, um, particularly the calves. And we see a lot of the calves in Mexico. Uh, most frequently, it's the calves coming in with fishing gear from outside the lagoon because the use of the fishing gear is not uh, permitted in the Mexican reserves uh, during the breeding season. But again, not in great numbers. Um, the emaciated or body condition, a lot low lipid tissue oil content that's been described, uh, and and the evidence of of what appear to be skinny whales that we see in, suggest a lack of food or a lack of access to food. And we all know that climate change and related environmental effects 
are affecting the, the North Pacific uh, and Arctic seas in, in, in uh, very, very fast um, uh, periods of time than, than has historically been observed. And we know that if this primary production is, uh, is the basis of food for many, many Arctic species and perhaps is affecting the gray whales as well. And I want to go to the next slide if I can, thank you. So in the case of the gray whales, uh, additional you know, uh, ideas about possible contributors to a UME could include the, uh, the uh, exceeding the carrying capacity. These, we saw in that graph, the NOAA graph of the population uh, history that they may exceed the capacity of the environment to support everyone. But in that case, you would expect that everyone would be skinny. And we see, uh, at least in the breeding season, all coming off of a summer, uh, both skinny and, and, and normal looking whales and some in between all mixed together. So it doesn't seem to be a uniform carrying capacity effect. Uh, climate change could be eliminating the production of gray whales primary food, and that could stress the whales. Uh, they either can't get to it because in some years the sea ice in the Arctic and North Pacific may prevent them from utilizing some of their primary feeding areas. That's another possibility. And we uh, are, are thinking that if food is limited, their condition would be expected to decline. They'd be unable to reproduce, bring calves to term and birth them and nurse them normally. And they may become susceptible to disease and malnutrition uh, because of the inability to feed all this. However, I offer we should consider this. The modern gray whale has been around for about 120,000 years, depending on which paleontologists you speak with. Uh, their ancestors date back more than 2 million years. Um, they've experienced post-glacial advances uh, in recent times. Uh, and during those times, sea level has changed repeatedly. Sometimes uh, their, their, feeding, their, their continental shelf feeding areas are below uh, the, the level of the ocean. Um, uh, and available, and other times they're above and not, uh, not accessible. Uh, a good example, of course, is uh, the Bering Land Sea, uh, the Bering Land Bridge uh, that prevented the animals from using some of those northern areas now because they were above, above sea level. So we like to think of gray whales uh, are as robust as it's a very appropriate name. They're coastal species, they have a generalist strategy. They're able to uh, change their feeding strategy within reason although they specialize in bottom feeding on invertebrates. If they encounter uh, other feeding opportunities, they're known to take advantage of uh, bottom suction as their primary goal, but they can also gulp like a rorqual and skim feed like a right whale. If, if uh, push comes to shove and there's available food, they can take advantage of it. And so this ability to utilize alternative prey, feeding modes, and locations has likely contributed to their success and will likely contribute to the continues of their success. So we know now they're going through a rough patch Historically, it appears uh, they've gone through previous rough patches, but managed to survive. And so we'd like to think that the gray whales are gonna be around for a while. So just a moment to say thank you to all of our sponsors that make all of this work in Mexico possible since 2006 and to present, and the program is still continuing. Uh, thanks to our graduate level researchers from the universities uh, throughout North America and, and some from Central America and even Europe, um, because they're the, they do the lion's share of the work and now, if there's a little bit of time, we'll be happy to entertain some questions. If you can't talk to us this evening, please go to our website, sanignaciograywhales.org, and you can chat with us there and leave us a message or send us an email, and we'll be happy to follow up on that. So with that, um, turn it back to uh, to the night, night, night school crew. Well, we have time for maybe a few questions. We're running a little behind tonight, but we have some time for some questions for you because people have a lot of them. So okay. thank you so much, Stephen, for your presentation. Um, here's an interesting question that just kind of came in near the end. But somebody mentioned that um, historically the West Coast has had uh, oscillations of anchovy versus sardine populations. Um, to what extent does this impact the gray whale population, if at all? Well, we, we know that gray whales have and are able to feed uh, to some degree on, uh, on pelagic you know, schooling prey like anchovies and, and sardines and even krill, crabs away, uh, mice and shrimps that hover in, in the water column. Uh, but it's not their primary food. So I suspect that, uh, again, if push comes to shove and there's nothing else around, they would try to eat those as best they could. Um, is that... Is that sort of the um, alternative prey that you talked about? Or what are some examples of the alternative prey that they Yeah, I, I would call it alternative prey. I, okay. I mentioned a few of those. The, 
During the previous UME and the years that followed, there was a lot of research going on around Kodiak Island and up off the Chirikoff Basin, looking at gray whale prey and gray whales occupying areas that, you know, they were not common to occupy. They usually just migrated through. Uh, and John will talk about some of the feeding of the sounders in the Puget Sound area. So they can switch to uh, swarming prey, like I said, like mice and shrimp that hover above uh, rocky uh, bottom uh, bottom areas in, in, in the coastal waters. Uh, uh, the small fish that we talked about, even krill, could be alternative prey for them. But remember, they are uh, morphologically and behaviorally uh, specialized as bottom feeders. They suck uh, invertebrates off the bottom or out of the bottom sediments. They can filter them. They're designed to do that. They're very good at finding those prey and feeding on them. But if those aren't around, uh, we do know that they can prey switch. Great. Um, here's another great question. Uh, so when you see, when your team is observing a pod traveling together, do they all generally have the same body type or are they all, yeah, are they, are they all, do they all tend to be like kind of skinny or, or all healthy looking? That's that's a question for someone who looks at them during their migration along the North American <laughs> coast. We're, we're okay. fortunate we don't have to do that. The whales come to us. <laughs> right. They they, okay. they they aggregate in, in and around those three lagoon areas and the bays in front of them uh, as, that I mentioned in the talk. And so we just have to be ready to get out on the water and uh, and count them and take pictures. Um. Do, do you know of um, whales that have fertility issues? Is that sometimes a factor? Well, we suspect uh, based on, you know, the basic reproductive biology of female uh, mammals that uh, the female has to have a certain amount of energy uh, stores in the case of a whale and body fat and blubber to support uh, bringing a pregnancy to term if she's not feeding. And then when she gets to the feeding grounds in that summer that uh, after she's conceived, she can restore her, replenish her, her body fat and body stores, uh, uh, blubber stores and so on, uh, while the calf is, uh, is developing and she's pregnant. And then she'll migrate south and uh, give birth to that calf and then nurse it for three to six months or more. Uh, so she's continuing to using up the body fat. And if she doesn't start feeding again, which generally means migrating north in the spring, which they do with their calves, she's going to run out of gas. And we think that that may be one of the things that's probably happening uh, with this skinny whale that we see arriving in Mexico. And they should be arriving fat because they should be coming off of a summer of feeding. And instead, they're getting down into the breeding range and they're, they're not looking very, very healthy. They're looking skinny already. Um, you know, when we first started seeing this, as I said, in 2019 and 20, the numbers started increasing. We just said to ourselves, these guys are going to run out of gas if they try to migrate back up to the higher latitudes for the summer. And sure enough, they started washing ashore. Yeah, yeah. And then um, finally, another question that we're seeing. So is for gray whales, are there any other breeding areas than the lagoons in Baja or is, or, or is that it? The, the winter range, uh, technically defined, is uh, from Puget Sound, uh, excuse me, from, uh, from uh, Central California, uh, Point Conception, south uh, through Southern California, down to Mexico, to Cabo San Lucas, the tip of Baja California. But some of them also would go over historically and some still to this day to the mainland of Mexico, directly across from Cabo San Lucas, and then up into okay. the Gulf of California. Uh, in some years, uh, so mm -hmm. that's that's their overall range. But th that's uh, the, that's the breeding range. Mating takes pl place during the southward migration in the fall. That's the migration brings the whales together after they've been spread out over their feeding uh, areas in the summer. Brings them together as they migrate. They they'll mate and they continue to mate when they get down into the uh, Southern California and the Mexican waters. And then uh, the females had previously. Uh, made it uh, made it the previous year would then give birth to those calves that are that are pretty near term and ready to be born yeah yeah okay well that's all we have time for but thank you so much and i do encourage um everyone to check out your, your website for more information i'll drop that in the comments um after we finish here um but next up we have john callum bokibis and um thanks so much again Stephen. you're very welcome thank you again for this opportunity we enjoyed it good
right? Uh, hello, and I don't know if I'm on already and if you can see my screen okay. Yeah, we can see you. It looks like your screen. Yeah, if you want to move, perfect. Okay, I'll add that to the, I'll add it. You're good to go. Perfect, thanks a lot. Nice to talk to all of you and hear these other exciting talks. Uh, uh, I'm based in Olympia, Washington. Uh, and even though I work quite a bit off California and in Mexico and Central America, uh, I'll primarily be talking about uh, our perspective on gray whales uh, from Washington State and the Pacific Northwest uh, and some of the work we've been doing both with some of the strandings and following up uh, some of what Mo shared and uh, uh, Steve shared, as well as talking about some of the kind of unique feeding and observations we have of gray whales uh, in our area. And, uh, you know, whales and in our area are kind of partway on the migration. Uh, we saw a couple of different versions of, of this slide and I'll just draw your attention to this square here on the map, which is the area I'm gonna be talking about, which encompasses some of those whales that are migrating past that uh, Steve was referring to and they're a part of that larger mortality event. But this square area here is also blown up here and I'm gonna talk about these Sounders gray whales that are right here in uh, Puget Sound. Uh, northern part of Puget Sound, just north of Seattle, very near the British Columbia border, and a little bit about what we've learned about those whales. Now, first looking at the stranding part that we've been hearing quite a bit about, uh, we have a really good consistent record of uh, strandings in Washington State, partly because even going back to the 1970s and 80s, we had researchers here that were uh, responding to strandings. I got involved in the late 1970s uh, in this myself. Uh, but you can see on this lower graph, these are number of strandings by year of gray whales. And you'll see quite a bit of up and down. Here in 1999 and 2000, you see these two higher bars. That's that unusual mortality event that was referred to earlier that occurred uh, you know, now 20 years ago. And then here you see this even higher spike in 2019. Uh, which is the current UME or unusual mortality event Mo described in her work. And you'll see that uh, uh, for us at least, we saw a pretty noticeable drop in 2020. Uh, this final bar right here uh, dropped this down. Still a number that was well above average, uh, but definitely down from some of those really high years uh, where we had. And <clears throat> up here in the top corner, uh, you see the strandings by month across all these periods. And, uh, and the main thing you'll see is that our strandings occur primarily from April through June, that three month period that very nicely coincides with some of what you've heard about the migrations of these gray whales. So this is the time period at the end of the period they've been in Mexico, largely not feeding they've started their migration back to these feeding areas that are primarily in the Arctic. Uh, though some, as I'll show you, are uh, in our area as well. Uh, but it's right at probably their, their, mo their most kind of depleted level, if you with, will. And so it makes sense that's the peak of our strandings right there in that late spring, early summer period where we get most animals dying. A few details on, on the strandings from 2019, that big highest single year. It was 34 dead animals that were documented in our state. Uh, just so you get a feeling for it, we were only able to lay eyes on and respond ourselves to 26 of those strandings. Uh, and when I say we, I'm really referring to this person you see in the lower right corner, Jesse Huggins, who's our stranding coordinator, and she's the one doing most of the work and examinations, looking at these animals for us. Uh, and she's been kept very busy starting in 2019. You'll see here uh, that at least of these 34 animals, you know, they were split pretty evenly between females and males. And you'll see that included adult, subadult animals and some of these smaller animals uh, as well. And we estimated at least of the ones, uh, uh, you know, that we could uh, look at 18 of those, uh, you know, uh, just over 50% uh, were in this 
pretty serious nutritional stress depleted status. And the other 50%, that doesn't mean they were healthy. In, in many cases, those were ones that were either bloated or we couldn't do a detailed enough exam to determine that status. You know, you've heard some of these considerations with the UME, uh, you know, and what's going on. And I'll just, so I'll be pretty brief on these, just that we know this population has recovered well. And the, the last population estimate before this 2019 UME was up around 27,000. That was even higher than some of us thought that Eastern North Pacific gray whale population had been at prior to whaling. Uh, and depleted and, and uh, had been depleted during whaling. Uh, we are partly concerned about this because we know the main area that gray whales feed in the Arctic has seen dramatic decreases in ice cover and changes. Uh, though ironically, uh, in some of the past correlations, uh, periods of lower ice have correlated actually with better reproductive success of gray whales. And that may be partly because uh, gray whales may get one kind of benefit from the decreasing ice and that it opens up more areas that they can access for longer periods. So that could have a benefit in one form, but really much more important is what's occurring to the Arctic ecosystem and their overall prey base. Uh, we are a little bit uh, you know, less concerned about the current UME because they did go through this one and uh, 1999 and 2000 that they bounced back from. Uh, and so, and we're also encouraged by the fact mortality did at least drop in what we saw in 2020, though now we're waiting for the full returns to come in from this year. Uh, so, you know, with that, I want to turn a little bit and talk about these Sounders gray whales, this unique group of gray whales that we think show a couple of interesting insights about gray whales overall. And they're a group of whales that we started seeing in 1990. Uh, it's not a very big group. It's only about a dozen animals. And we primarily see them uh, from March through June. And so they're whales that come into Puget Sound. They have to deviate from their migration to come in, into this area to feed. Uh, and it's the same individuals returning year after year. Uh, and now just to look at that area, uh, this top left panel here is out of a, a paper we've done on kind of important feeding areas for gray whales. And I'll just highlight a couple of things out of this paper. One is this is this area inside Puget Sound here. And you can see this is actually a relatively small area we're looking at here. Just an area that's, uh, you know, maybe five, 10 miles by 20 miles long. Uh, that these sounders gray whales return and feed every year to. Now, I also want to point out in these other maps showing Washington, Northern California, and Oregon, and Central Oregon, there's shaded areas and, and dots that are sightings of gray whales. That's this area that uh, Steve referred to, the Pacific Coast Feeding Group of gray whales. That's this group of gray whales that spends often the spring, summer, and fall feeding out in those waters. Uh, it may seem confusing, but out on the uh, kind of outer coast and these outside areas, we have these Pacific Coast feeding group gray whales that spend the spring, summer, and fall feeding. But the Sounders gray whales that come into this small area of northern Puget Sound, they're generally not part of the Pacific Coast feeding group, and they seem to be more whales that uh, are part of that migrating group that continues on to the Arctic later. Uh, but has learned to deviate from their migration and come and feed. And I'll come back to that point a little bit in a few minutes. Uh, we've heard a little bit about gray whales being, you know, uh, specialized bottom feeders. Uh, and, you know, this is looking straight down uh, from an aerial image of a feeding gray whale. I should probably update this photograph. I have a lot, lot better photographs now, but uh, this is kind of a characteristic image of a gray whale feeding on the bottom where you have its head up here, it's flukes back here, and you have this plume of mud streaming behind it. That's the result of the fact the gray whale was feeding right on the bottom, sucking in water and sediment and some of the uh, <clears throat> uh, critters that live in the sediment. And then as it filters it out, it leaves that plume of mud. What's somewhat unique about our Sounders gray whales is they're feeding in intertidal zones. So that means they're feeding in areas 
that are so shallow, they're totally high and dry at low tide, and the whales can only access the area at high tide. And at high tide, we have big tides in Puget Sound, but that still means the water is so shallow that when you see gray whales feeding in this area, this is typically what you'll see. These are some gray whales feeding in just eight to 10 feet of water. Uh, so little water that they often have parts of their peck fins or parts of their flukes sticking out above the water uh, as they try to get into these really shallow water areas to feed. And then when the tide goes out, this is an aerial image of uh, part of the Skokomish River Delta. And you see these little dimples where my cursor is, and there's you know more than 50 of them visible here. These are actually feeding pits, almost six feet long and about three feet wide, created by a gray whale feeding in that area at high tide. And it's actually created this depression in the mud that now is collecting water at low tide. So it makes it very easy to see these feeding pits at low tide. Um, and, and, and that's kind of a unique feature of that. And these feeding pits are so distinctive and so obvious, you can go on to Google Earth right now and <coughs> be able to see gray whale feeding pits uh, in several areas around this area I'm describing of Northern Puget Sound. Uh, this is right off of the city of Everett. Uh, this is a, an image from Google Earth. And in Google Earth, what you need to do, there's a little clock icon that you click on and it lets you access uh, you know, uh, past satellite photographs of these areas. So for example, this is a Google Earth image. Uh, we've, I've pushed this little pointer on the clock icon back. In this case, it's showing an image from May 23rd, 2005. And here, right in Google Earth, with no enhancement, are all of these very obvious feeding pits uh, in here and, uh, you know, in this exposed sediment. So partly we have to be able to zoom in, we have to be in the right area, we have to be in springtime, and we have to find an image that's at low tide that shows us this intertidal area. Uh, and so it's you, you won't see it in many of the images. And here you'll see a little consolidation. This is another Google Earth image, but now these big white areas you see here are actually the result uh, of one of our uh, uh, interns who did a project where he went through and marked every feeding pit in Google Earth with a little white dot. And he ended up marking over 20,000 of these feeding pits that were visible in different images. And then here, what looks like a a sea of white is actually thousands of these white dots marking different feeding pits. So you, you can see they're clustered in certain areas that at high densities of these ghost shrimp. Uh, so this is a paper we're trying to get published. It's a neat way just to be able to use Google Earth to document feeding. And in fact, one thing we found is there's some new images that just came up on Google Earth from 2020 and they showed higher densities of feeding pits than we had seen in any of our past images. And it reflected that uh, partly as a response to this unusual mortality event, these gray whales have been feeding longer, more intensely, and there have been more of them. And that's had a result. Now I mentioned these were some of the same gray whales. And in this figure here, each row here is a different individual. And then these goes from go from the year 1990 up to 2020. Uh, so you have, uh, 30 years represented here. And where it's green, it means that whale was seen that year. And you'll see a number of these whales first showed up in 1990, 91, and have been seen the majority of years since then. Uh, now going on, in fact, with some of the whales we've seen in 2022 now, going on 32 years for some of these whales that we've seen. And most of them are males. We've been able to sex most of them, but there are some females. This particular second animal that we call Earhart, because we kind of view she was the pioneering female seen in the very first year we documented them using this area. She's a female, but we've never seen her with a calf, but you can see there are chunks of time every three to four years that she doesn't show up. And we think those are the years she has a calf. And either because she's migrating later, which mothers with calves do, or she realizes what a high risk feeding strategy this is 
she does not come into this area to feed. And that's why you see these white squares. Okay, uh, I'm gonna try to pick up a little uh, uh, faster here and go through because I wanna show you a couple of videos uh, too. Uh, one more slide I can return to though, that's combining two pieces of data. I showed you this slide before of the number of dead gray whales in Washington state, but now you'll see these shaded gray bars and they represent the years that new Sounders whales discovered and started using that area. And it corresponds with this scale on the right. And you'll see that uh, we had these initial whales discover the area in 1990 and 91. We had an influx of another six whales in 1999, 2000. And now in 2018 and 2019, we've had a new uptick in new whales joining this group. And you'll notice each of these periods corresponds with periods of elevated mortality. So it really ends up fitting what would drive whales to deviate from their migration, come and undertake this high risk feeding strategy in the intertidal zone? Well, the answer is it's years where they're desperate to feed and when they're skinny and they're facing feeds, food shortages in the Arctic, it makes that strategy worthwhile. And once they discover it, they know to come back and keep using it and then it becomes more reliable. Uh, as a feeding area. Now to better document the benefit they're getting from feeding, we've been working with a, a group called SR3 and John Durbin and Holly Fernbaugh doing some of the very same kind of body condition measurements that Steve described for the lagoons uh, that have been conducted. Uh, Holly and John do some of the very detailed health assessments of some of the Southern resident killer whales and then starting Two years ago, we started to apply this to the Sounders gray whales. Uh, and we've also been measuring their condition with some indications from the side and, and boat photographs. So we can kind of sample that over a longer period. But these drone-based photographs have been far more instructive and really eye-opening. Uh, here you see one of our male gray whales. Here's the body condition it showed up with. You can see, if you remember Steve's image, this is sort of not a particular, a little bit of a skinny gray whale, but not as skinny as the skinny one he showed. But here is the same whale just two weeks later and then another week after that. And look at how much girthier and wider that whale became just in feeding three weeks on these dense goat shrimp beds uh, in the area. And we saw this and it actually surprised me. It surprised John and Holly that these whales feeding in this short period, uh, you know, would be actually changing their body size and condition this dramatically. Uh, so it was quite surprising to us. Uh, a couple of quick things I'll run through, you know, gray whales still face threats by coming into uh, Puget Sound and other areas. They do face entanglement. This is just taken from uh, a whale we had entangled in Dungeness crab gear, one of the, uh, fisheries that they uh, conflict with uh, just last year. And this is one that uh, Kirsten Flynn and myself were able to successfully disentangle. Uh, it was a whale that uh, uh, had uh, uh, rope going through its mouth that came out of both sides of its mouth, then came tangled together, went down to a crab pot and had some trailing buoys. It didn't give us much to grab onto. But we were able to, even though it was free swimming, uh, it was cooperative enough. We were able to get close enough and use some of the specialized gear, in this case, a pole with what's called a flying cutting head uh, that allowed us to hook onto that line coming out of one side of its mouth, uh, cut that line, and then pull on the other side and have a completely successful disentanglement. So we were able to document that this whale was completely free. Uh, you know, Interestingly, usually we use multiple boats with a larger team of people, but this was right in the midst of the COVID epidemic. So we actually did this with uh, uh, just our single vessel. Uh, we had some standby vessels for safety uh, and just two of us in the boat. But we uh, uh, usually what would be a bad thing, we had a news helicopter uh, circling the whole time, live streaming video and I was able to have a very experienced disentanglement person uh, uh, you know, on the phone 
that was watching the live stream that could actually tell us what they could see as it was happening. And that was Doug Sandilands of SR3. So we had a virtual third person that uh, allowed us to do it. Um, let's see, I'm gonna show you just a little bit of kind of interesting footage that gives you a little bit of a feeling of how these gray whales feed. And uh, in uh, a few years ago, we deployed some of these, what we call multi-sensor video tags. Uh, we've been deploying these suction cup attached tags on a variety of whale species. I've actually deployed hundreds of these on different species of whales, but for the first time a few years ago, we deployed these on some of the sounders gray whales. And this is one of the tags we deployed. You know, it's got flotation, so it will float. It records data on board. I'll show you some of the, it records 12, uh, you know, sensors of data. Uh, so it's gathering a huge amount of data and it has two video cameras uh, facing right and left in this case, uh, right at the very front of this. Uh, and for example, uh, this is the very first deployment we did on a gray whale and it had rather surprising results. And before I run this video, I'm just gonna show you down below here, you actually see some of the different sensors that are recording data, you know, that are all color coded on these two different charts. You'll also see a vertical bar here sliding from left to right. And that's tracking where in the stream of data the video that you're seeing is looking at. And this video in this case is looking along the back of the gray whale. In this case, this is our video camera that faces slightly to the right, but it's facing straight along the back of the whale. And this video, uh, this camera is facing a little bit left right now out into space. And we were really happy. This was a deployment slightly on the right side of the whale. It would let us film the whales feeding, which is what we wanted to use these tags to document how often they were feeding, how long it took, and looking at some of the characteristic sensor signals. So as I run this, the very first, and this is on Earhart, uh, that female that we mentioned, and uh, just a, a five minutes into the tag deployment, here comes a whale along, a second whale, and right there makes direct contact with Earhart and spins our tag around so that now our tag is perfectly facing backwards on the whale. You know, so now you see here, we see the trailing whale that just did that. And at first we were kind of disappointed in this because it was, oh, you know, this is, we wanted to film the feeding of whales, but this ended up being kind of an interesting deployment uh, in that then it ended up feeding the fact that this female, as she swam into shallow water, was actually being trailed by three of the male sounder gray whales. And you'll see here's the head of one uh, coming into view on the right, but you'll see it almost connects with this left image too. So there's one sounder whale swimming right along behind it. Uh, and, and to me, this was just amazing to get to see you know, these whales and how they move. You can see there's actually contact occurring between the pectoral flipper of this whale, uh, you know, and our tagged whale. And now you'll see a, a second whale coming into view, another uh, uh, male sounder whale, and here's a third whale. So there are three male uh, whales actually following uh, this whale into the shallow intertidal zone. I think she's the one, maybe they, they don't actually feed together when they get into the shallows, but it looked like they were taking the cue from her of when to head into the shallow water to begin that feeding. Uh, and and that, uh, that tagging sometimes had, uh, and that contact sometimes had benefits, like here, here's a rear facing tag. We're looking backwards on the whale and you'll actually see there's two whales following this whale. And, and you can see the tag is kind of loose and about to come off. And here you'll see these two other whales are actually rubbing up against this whale, making contact with it. Uh, and they do this several times. In this case, they don't make contact with the tag. They're just rubbing against other parts of the whale's body. Uh, but then slightly later here, you'll see uh, one of the whales right there rubs up against the whale and with its head actually makes contact with the tag and now turns the tag around, presses it firmly back into place, and now our tag is perfectly facing forward, exactly the position we wanted. And here we see, now we see the right side of the whale, and we see the left side of the whale, and when it surfaces, 
you'll actually see its blowholes uh, here and it's showing the whale, you know, swimming through the water. So uh, this tag ended up staying on 67 hours, an unprecedented duration. I think we ended up beating that with only one other tag, partly because the whales kept pressing it on. And part of what we got from these tags uh, in red down here is the roll sensor on the tag. And each of these plateaus that you see down here is actually the whale rolling 90 degrees on its right side and engaging in a feeding event where it's creating one of those feeding pits. Uh, and you'll see that here. As soon as it dives down, it took a breath. Right away, it's on the bottom. You'll actually see some holes on the bottom. These are a ghost shrimp bed, little plume of mud where it makes contact with the bottom. Again, those are feeding holes from some of the ghost shrimp. And then you'll see this cloud of uh, sediment as the whale starts, uh, you know, siphoning uh, some of the mud uh, and creating one of these feeding pits. So here you see kind of mud streaming by the whale as it's, you know, filter feeding. You'll even see a ghost shrimp float by there. So what we ended up learning is these whales were, uh, this is the uh, record of one of these tags. And you'll see this is time along the x-axis. Here's the tidal cycle that you'll see in orange going up and down. And the feeding periods are these periods right here, 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 and here. And you can see they're only feeding right at high tide, primarily as the tide is coming in and slightly as the tide starts to fall, but they know to get out of the area to feed. Uh, and all of that feeding is occurring just at about two meters or six to eight feet of water depth. Now, sometimes that kind of feeding gets whales in trouble. This is actually a, a whale that became stranded on the outer coast uh, that was trying to feed in shallow waters in amongst the breakers. It was still alive. It was stranded high and dry for several days. We were actually able to uh, help pull this whale out. It was an inaccessible area. We couldn't bring heavy equipment. We couldn't get boats to this site, but we were actually able to uh, anchor a pulley system offshore a little bit and then put this really soft harness going underneath the peck fins and over the back of the whale. And then we actually used, uh, we had 30 people on shore pulling on this rope as the tide came in and it helped pivot the whale uh, so that it was head out. We don't wanna pull it from its flukes, but we were able to help orient it out. And then as the waves jostled it, we were able to work it and free this whale. Okay, so just to finish up a few of the points uh, from my talk, just that uh, these gray whales turn out to be more complicated than we gave them credit for. They're much more versatile in their feeding and perhaps more resilient because of it. Uh, we, uh, we've learned a lot of uh, answers, but we've also gotten new questions about these gray whales that, and they've tested some of our assumptions about there being just these highly specialized feeders. They're actually pretty versatile in, in their feeding. And you know they represent a success story of recovering from whaling, but now we have these Western gray whales Steve referred to that are still in trouble. We have these UME events we're trying to understand. And we're also trying to make sure that these big changes occurring as climate and ice conditions change don't have a ne negative effect on them. Okay, uh, I hope I didn't go too long there, but uh, uh, that uh, is my uh, presentation and I'll leave it to the organizers whether there's uh, time for any questions. We have time for some questions. Hi, John. Um, first, we love the whale videos and also that the female was named Earhart. Um, but let's get into the questions. So the first one is one that we did ask Mo, uh, but she deferred to you. Um, how many do you estimate die but don't wash ashore and just sink? Yeah, and, and Mo did a great job of answering that in the sense that we don't know that precisely, uh, but the best calculations we've been able to come up with that it's only 10 to 20% of the whales that die actually wash up and get documented. Uh, so that that's kind of scary. That means when you document hundreds of uh, deaths as we have in these UMEs or even getting up to thousands, uh, the true number could be five to 10 times, uh, you know, uh, that number. So it does represent a pretty impressive number. Um, and I think the best estimate that uh, we're trying to actually do a paper on this, and I think it's coming out somewhere closer to that 20% number 
you know, which would mean only one in five gets documented and four in five may sink and never be discovered. That's unfortunate. Um, moving to the next question, are, are, are the whales competing with humans with the shrimp? Um, and is there enough shrimp in these feeding pits if more and more whales join the Sounders group? Yes, no, that's a great question because uh, uh, ghost shrimp actually are harvested. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a human harvest for it as primarily for live bait. Uh, it's not a very big harvest, uh, but it uh, also harvests the ghost shrimp in the same, some of the same areas the gray whales feed. Uh, and so there's been concern about that. At this point, the initial estimates. Uh, you know, suggests that uh, the amount of ghost shrimp that the gray whales are taking and that are taken in that harvest only represents 10 to 20% of the total biomass of ghost shrimp. Uh, so it, it appears at the present moment, and this was a conclusion the state agencies realized that, uh, and I shouldn't say present moment, we actually did this four years ago, uh, that there was enough ghost shrimp for both. But as we've seen more sounders gray whales and they've had to feed longer. And our tag data has confirmed that uh, they're solely feeding on the ghost shrimp while they're in that area. Uh, I think it's an, gonna be an important question to revisit because it looks like they're uh, using that to a greater degree than they were when we last estimated this. Um, you showed the photo of the sounder across the three weeks and how its girth kind of grew across like pretty quickly over three weeks. How long would that growth normally take? Huh. Yes, I and, and I think that's a really great question that we don't know the answer to because uh, it hasn't been uh, you know, possible to get those kinds of precise measurements, especially tracking the same whale. What's unique about our Sounders gray whales that give us this great opportunity is that it's not only the same whales coming back year after year, so we can track it by individual whale, but when we track that growth, we can photograph that same whale at multiple times over this three month period. Uh, and that's a lot harder to do in, in other areas. And we have one more thing that is unique in the Sounders and that's because we have these feeding pits and now this tag data tells us, uh, you know, how many pits they're excavating, you know, uh, you know, each day. And we're actually even able to measure how much prey got removed out of each pit. Uh, for the yeah. first time, we've actually been able to put in all the pieces of an energetics equation with these whales. It's actually a project we've been trying to get a PhD student to take on because uh, we're, we're getting these interesting pieces of information uh, uh, that haven't been available from any other gray, wh gray whale or any other large whale pop population. Cool. Um we have time for maybe a couple more questions. Um, do adult sounders bring or train their young to feed in Puget Sound? Yes, well, I think that's a great question because in the Pacific Coast Feeding Group, those whales that feed off the uh, you know Pacific Northwest coastal waters, we do see mothers with calves and the calves do seem to learn the areas to feed with their parents and then come back and return to those areas. We have not seen that with the sounders. Uh, and uh, and that's that product of the fact that they're mostly males, <laughs> so they don't have any calves to bring. And even the ones that are females don't seem to come there with their calves. So we haven't seen that sort of uh, exchange from mother to offspring. But what we have seen is that when new whales show up in the area, they seem to learn from each other by following mm -hmm. each other into the shallows. So there is learning occurring, but it doesn't seem to be from older to uh, younger whales just because we're not seeing those calves. Interesting. Um, and last question, do you have, since you've been tracking whales for so long, do you have a few favorites that you get excited and relieved to see um, when you see them again? Yes, uh, and all of these whales, uh, you know, uh, you know, it's kind of neat because a lot of people live in areas that overlook the areas of these whales. I mean, not only do I have favorites and we've given names to many of these whales, uh, you know, and Patch is sort of a perennial favorite. Uh, it's a it's an adult male, but it's got this giant white patch that you saw in one of my photographs, so you can recognize it from a mile away or more. Uh, and uh, so I think it's between Patch and Earhart, that female that just mm -hmm. uh, 
uh, has those unique, uh, uh, you, we think, pioneering qualities uh, uh, that have established that area are my two favorites. But it's fascinating to see many of the residents of these areas, you know, hundreds of people and all of the whale watchers know these whales by name as well. So other yeah. people have other favorites too. Yeah, that must be nice to see them. Um, when they come the next year. All right, well, thank you so much, John. It was great having you on with us tonight. Um, up next, we have Barbie. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for sticking around. I am the last talk of the evening, but um, we'll just start to get to it. So um, tonight I wanna to talk to you a little bit about foraging to be fat um, insights into the nutritional condition of uh, gray whales. As you've heard tonight, it's kind of an overlapping theme of what's happening with these animals as they go through their migration, what they're eating, what they're doing. So I'm the necropsy manager at the Marine Mammal Center and I work very closely with Mo Flannery um, to uh, tackle these large dead whales that wash ashore in the San Francisco Bay Area. I also crazily decided to take on a master's project with these amazing animals um, to discover a little bit more about them. And they are truly an incredible species. They, um, they have always stolen my heart. They're one of my favorite animals to um, get more involved with, with the whales. They're just, they're absolutely beautiful. I think to see them alive is just absolutely breathtaking but to really appreciate them fully. I really love anatomy. And so you get to look at them on shore, see what's happening with them, seeing what's going on with them, determine how they died, determine how they lived. Um, it all tells a story with each whale that we are able to necropsy. So we see these whales inside the San Francisco Bay. We've got a couple, um, as Mo Flannery said earlier, we also see them on shore dead. And so that's why we're here to respond to these animals, to see what's happening and to take lots of different data specimens from them. And these are just some of the pictures of some of the, my favorite animals that we've done in different areas. But this one was kind of super beautiful. You can see she's got some cool barnacle patterns and the different white um, splotches and scarring that's happened from the barnacle. So really cool. So gray whales are going to feed in their Arctic feeding grounds. This is their primary area where they like to feed. Think of this as the buffet. When they're going up there, they're, they're eating as much as they can. So they usually feed in the summer months from May to September. And these are the months they actually target because this is when the sea ice has regressed or has um, thawed enough to allow enough sunlight and allow the ecosystem to um, become more, uh, to flourish. It allows the photosynthesis for some of those organisms to flourish more. And then it sprinkles down into the um, benthic layers. So when they're up here, they actually get the majority of their calories and fat gained during this time. So they're essentially just eating as much as they can um, for as long as they can to, to get all the calories they need. So John talked a little bit about the foraging strategies for these guys. So they primarily forage on benthic invertebrates such as amphipods. So one of those that he talked about his sounders eating are these ghost shrimp. And what's just incredible to me is they are tiny, tiny critters, right? They're so little, yet these whales are able to eat enough to gain, to go on this great migration that they do. So the foraging strategy that he was talking about is the suction feeding, where the whale dives down, it'll pick up sand and sediment in its mouth, filters out that sand and sediment, and then eats the uh, prey that it's, that's in there um, before. From there, we've also got gulp lunging as well as skin feeding. So these are two other types of uh, ways that whales feed. You will see the gulp and lunge feeding done by blue whales, fin whales, humpbacks, and then skin feeding are more along the lines with your uh, right whales. However, there, um, Steve mentioned earlier that there have been some whales, uh, gray whales that have been known to display these other types of feeding strategies. So maybe they are able to switch um, to different prey when they need to, maybe when their prey source, like the, these amphipods are no longer um, available or, or in as high abundance. So this is just a video, it's a drone uh, video from Captain Dave, Dana Point Dolphin um, and Whale Watching Safari. I just thought it was a really cool video because it shows you um, how the feeding strategy actually happens from, from the um, drone footage. 
So I'll just let this play out. But you can see the animal here. You got the pectoral fins. It's going down. You can see the mud kind of going behind. Then it turns on its side, opens its mouth, takes in a whole bunch of the um, sediment and sand in that area, and then swims away, leaving behind this trail of debris because it's filtering it out, taking in whatever food source it might have. So I just thought it was kind of a cool video to show you what's what's happening and why they're doing this. And as you can see, this was taken down in Ocean, um, sorry, in Orange County. So they're feeding at different areas or they're snacking at different areas on their way up the coastline. So the reason they need to eat all of these calories in their feeding gardens in the Arctic is because they have a very, very long trip ahead. They travel round trip 10 to 12,000 miles, which is just incredible. It's such a huge trip for them to do. And it's normally that it's all done with just this one feeding trip that's done here. So they need a lot of calories. So they'll start in the Arctic seas of Alaska and near Russia in this area here. They'll migrate down um, by uh, Canada through Washington area, Oregon, California, and then they go to those lovely lagoons in Mexico for mating and calving. They do have those short feeding trips. I just want to note that. So they're seen along the Northern California area, in Oregon, in Washington, in Canada as well. So they'll, they'll have those little snacking trips on their way um, back up north. So what I really want to know is, are they starving or are they fasting? What are we seeing with this UME? So right now, emaciation or the animal having a lack of blubber or being really skinny is the primary finding that's happening with this unusual mortality event. So this has been happening since 2019, and Mo Flannery spoke a little bit about this. And I just thought this picture was just awe. It, it's incredible this animal was able to get this skinny. You can see here the backbone is completely showing the ribs, you can actually count on a whale that is supposed to have so much fat. I, you can't, I can't even imagine how skinny and what this poor animal had to go through to get to this point. It no longer even has a neck. It's completely disappeared and it's just um, skeletal muscle and skin connection. So it's just extremely skinny. But what I want to know is we don't know what normal fasting looks like? What does normal fasting blubber actually look like as opposed from an animal that is starving? So I really want to look more into this. And then why are they starving in some years, but why are they, and then in other years, more robust? Is there something happening in the Arctic? Are um, more food, less food, more whales, less whales? What's happening with all of this? So a lot to look into. So currently right now to look for nutritional condition, there is the drone and photogrammetry data and all these amazing photographs that these guys are taking. So Steve and uh, John, their work that they've been doing, they're, they're taking pictures of all these. It's amazing because it's non-invasive. You're very little disturbance to these animals. So you're able to take these nice snapshots and pictures as they go along without having to um, take a knife to them or anything along those lines. It's very non-invasive. From there, however, we're only able to look at this animal externally. And for me, as a person who does necropsies and uh, loves anatomy, I want to see what's going on inside. I want to see what the normal physiology of the animal is. And with these pictures, you can tell so much that they're in good, robust body condition, but the physiology and how it works is still unknown. And so we wanna learn a little bit more about this. So this is where stranded dead whales come into. This is my bread and butter. This is my, I love them. They're just so beautiful and amazing. So we are able to gather more morphometrics. So those are the measurements that we take at necropsy. So whether it's the, when you put the tape measure at the nose tip all the way to the tail tip, if you're getting fluke um, dimensions or if you're getting girths, all of those are very important on every single animal that we have that lands on the beach on every whale. We really wanna also determine sex and age class if we can. A lot of this data isn't known until the animals actually show up on land. We know we have a smaller whale, a larger whale, maybe a whale that is um, 12 meters long, maybe a whale that's 10 meters long, but until we determine a little bit more, we don't know the age class or the sex. So this is what we can do with the dead. 
we also really want to try and find out what the cause of death is. This was an animal from 2019. It was a yearling gray whale that was uh, landed dead inside the bay. And you can see this really large area of dark tissue here, and it's actually blood. So what happened is it was struck by a ship and you need to actually be alive to create bruising. So this is essentially a really large bruise that happened. So it was hit hard enough to cause this bruising and uh, eventually cause the animal to die. So we really wanna see what's happening with the whales that are coming along our shorelines. Are they emaciated? Are they being struck by ships or having some type of human interaction? So to learn a little bit more about these. And then for the good stuff, this is what I want to do. For acquiring the full thickness blubber sample, this to me is gold. It's just a gold mine in here. There's so much data, there's so much information. But what's amazing is the stranding network or the people that are um, permitted along the West Coast to respond to these dead whales have been collecting these full thickness blubber samples for years because we wanna look at toxicology. We wanna look at the nutritional content. So we've been archiving them. So I'm trying to go back 20 years worth of data to, um, to compile and look at almost 20 years worth of data that encompasses the entire West Coast of North America. So why is blubber so exciting? It is great. It is the main tissue for fat storage. So up here in this picture above, we basically cut a gray whale. We've cut through the skin. So the skin is the gray here on top. And then all of this below is the blubber thickness. So it's, it's, a, it's a good amount. It can be 17 to 10, 10 to 17 centimeters or so. So it's this really cool um, tissue. Then right below it, you have the fascia, which is this kind of like white, um, kind of stringy looking. And then below that, you'll have the skeletal muscle and how the animal actually moves. So the blubber is such a cool tissue because it aids in thermoregulation. Think of blubber as a way that the whale keeps warm while it's in the water. It also is able to stay cool if it's using a lot of energy to work and move around because there's a lot of blood vessels that go into the blubber for stores. They also have buoyancy. Um, it, it's, blubber is actually pretty light until you get a really large chunk off a whale, but it's a, lot, it's a little bit lighter and allows the whales to have a little bit more control of their buoyancy. It also creates a really nice hydrodynamic shape for the whale. If you don't have a lot of blubber, you're going to have your scapula or your rib cage or your um, vertebrae sticking out where the water will have to kind of go through those crevices. So the blubber creates this torpedo-like um, shape for the whales and allows them to cruise through the water really easily. So what I really want to do with blubber is create a nutritional condition profile. So I want to look at blubber through three different lenses. One of those is going to be histology, so looking at it underneath a microscope. And then the two others are going to be looking at total lipid content and fatty acid profile. And what I'm doing is I'm gathering samples from all these amazing stranding network participants for the last 20 years. So I'm trying to target from 1990 all the way until 2021. And I'm getting blubber samples from all these folks so that I can then look further into what we can compare. Are there age class differences? Are there sex differences? You know, does a adult female that's traveling up the coastline with her calf have significantly depleted blubber layers versus an adult female that doesn't have to worry about nursing a young as she is also fasting in this behavior. So really cool differences to check out. I also want to see if there's yearly differences. Is there some type of trend that's happening between the years? Maybe there's a prey source switch or, or excuse me, a prey switch, or maybe the prey quality isn't as robust as it once was. And so there's these uh, yearly differences. I also want to look at um, the seasonal differences. So, you know, we learned earlier that the animals get fat when they're up in the Arctic. So more towards the uh, summer months. So at the end of September, they will, um, they'll start to migrate down to the lagoons um, and mate along the way. At that point in time, they should be in the best body condition that they, they could be in because they've just been, they've been at a buffet for the last three months, just eating as much as they can. But what I really want to see is what if some of the animals that die maybe in November, December, what is their blubber 
depth look like and their blood work composition look like, as opposed to an animal that is um, probably on, you know, the last wing of, or the last leg of its journey up north back to the sea. So an animal that strands dead in Washington and has already gone through this whole season and has been um, uh, not starving, but um, fasting its whole way along. So I really want to look at those differences. So for that, we need to look at histology and look further at adipocytes. So adipocytes, we're just gonna keep it real simple because I am still learning all of this as well. Um, adipocytes are cells that are adapted for fat storage. So they're literally these cool cells. Um, they're essentially right here in this um, square, or sorry, this circle right here. There are these uh, bubble-like structures, and these are the adipocytes. So this is where all that fat is able to go in. The adipocytes can swell when there's more fat and more lipid abundance, and then they'll shrink when there's less. And the really cool thing about um, blubber is that it is layered. So think of Shrek, he's got layers. The same thing is true for blubber. So um, just to kind of take this picture a little bit more. So what we've done here is, the big blubber chunk that you saw in the whale earlier, I've cut it down and I've trimmed it down to a more manageable size, as you can see here, a lot smaller. From there, I've taken a very thin cut section, we put it into a cassette, and then it's sliced even thinner by a machine called a microtome that'll do it very thinly for us. After that, we're able to get some staining, different types of staining so that different colors and different cells pop out more regularly. So here you've got the skin of the gray whale, and then you've got the blubber behind it, or the blubber going down. The same thing is true just for this histology slide. So this dark purple kind of here at the top is all the skin layer. Down below is all the blubber layer, and you can see the adipocytes. But you notice here, you know, right next to the skin, there's not a lot of adipocytes, but there, there probably should be. Maybe there's an abundance. So what I'd like to do is create um, a an index to say, okay, how many are in this area in the outer blubber that's closer to the skin? How many adipocytes are there? What is their size? What is their color? And kind of look at it through those lenses. And adipocyte size really does matter. The, the more um, lipid content you have, the fatter the animal should be and the fatter or the wider these cells should be. So from there, I also want to look at the total lipid because the, the lipids are found throughout all the different layers, but the fatty acid compositions are gonna be different within each layer. The inner layers are gonna be um, a different type of fatty acid that is more easily metabolized so that the animal has quick um, energy or has energy when it needs it. Whereas these fatty acids that are, are contained in the upper and outer layer will be a little bit more for structure and to kind of hold everything together. So lipids, if we're thinking about lipids in general, lipids are comprised of fatty acids, triglycerides, and cholesterol. So it's kind of a composition of all three of those. So when you're looking at total lipid, you're getting a percentage of all of those different values. So those three different types of values. After that, well, I wanna look more into fatty acids because it really actually will help us uncover the foraging behavior and the diets behind these animals. Just by looking at their blubber, we'll be able to see if the adipocytes are in there, if they're robust, if they're robust, what are they filled with? What types of fatty acids are they filled with? So just some kind of cool, um, I, I've, I've been nerding out about this so much, so I'm, I've really been enjoying it thus far, but just such a cool um, and useful technique that we can use for these animals and they've already died. So why not do more with the samples and learn as much as we can from their deaths? So my last part here is implications for the Arctic. So we know climate change in the Arctic is causing dramatic changes to the sea ice. And this is a picture from NOAA um, climate.gov. And here, this is February 1979 and then October 1979. So February, there should be quite a bit of ice still there. And then as, as of October, after kind of the um, melting through the summer goes back, the sea ice will regress a little bit more. But then we start to look over at February 2013 and October 2013, and you can start to see the differences in the actual significance of the sea ice that's no longer covering the Arctic anymore. So it's allowing different, um, it, it's got a lot of impactions for different species and us humans that um, could be up in those areas. So I just wanted to point that out. And then now I have lots of questions. So 
is the sea ice changing gray whales' um, primary prey species? Are those amphipods that they normally feed on, are they more abundant because now there's more light that's able to penetrate the areas that they're not normally able to get to, or are the gray whales able to get to those areas that they normally wouldn't have been able to because of the sea ice? Is there just less prey in general? Maybe there's something that's happening with the amphipod population up there that's causing a decrease and there's just less prey overall. Are there other animals that are um, now competing for the same food source? Because the ice is regressing, maybe it's opening up a nice golden window for other species to get in there and eat different um, prey sources that they might not normally have targeted um, in the past. And then my other, I, what I really want to know is the prey quality changing. So when a gray whale is eating a ton of amphipods at this buffet, is it um, eating potato chips and is it stocking up on potato chips or is it eating big butter sticks where it's going to accumulate that big lipid store and um, for the migration ahead. So what's the prey quality changing to? And then my last is, are the gray whales also able to change their feeding strategies? Are these animals, are they able to actually do the gulp feeding or the skim feeding where they're able to change their prey source so that if the amphipod population is decreasing, can they move to krill? Can they move to some other food source to supplement the calories that they need for their journey ahead? So that's all I have tonight. And I just wanted to say thank you. I really want to thank all of the West Coast Training Network members. It's such amazing and hard work and all your countless hours. Thank you to the local private family foundation for their support. To the Gray Whale um, Unusual Mortality Working Group, could not do it without you. And I've learned so much from everyone. My advisor, Dan Crocker, um, for putting up with me. California Academy of Sciences and their amazing partnership on these whales. We could not do it. And then, of course, the Marine Mammal Center's rocking necropsy team. From this picture here, you can just see it always takes a team. We didn't actually successfully drag this animal out of the water, but it always takes a team to do anything with whales. You just need more support. Thank you so much, Barbie. That was that was awesome. And I thank you. Um, Got some people really interested in blubber for the first time who are gonna go home and be like, did you know about whale blubber being amazing? Um, it's also very beautiful when it's stained and under a, mm -hmm. under a slide. So, um, okay, well, if you're up for it, we have a few questions. I know it's sure. been a long night and I thank everyone for still sticking with us. Um, yeah, so um, let's see. We have a lot of questions for you. Um, so, you know, you mentioned um, just about some of the questions you still have, but people were wondering, um, do you think increased Arctic exploitation, like oil, increased shipping and stuff will also have an impact on, on the whales? I think it is a huge possibility. Um, with a lot of the sea ice regression, where now humans are able to get into areas that we weren't not able to get into more. So there could be more mm -hmm. um, shipping that's in that areas. And then all the other ecological impacts that come when we when humans come around. So whether that's the prey sources that that gray whales feed on or prey sources for um, other bird species that are up there and any other Arctic species. So I think it's gonna be a huge impact with all of it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then it's really interesting how you'll be able to look kind of at the blubber and see what kind of different fats. Um, is there a specific type of prey that is maybe like the most valuable prey in terms of adding the most to the blubber? That's what I that's what I really would like to look for more yeah. in my work. So the fatty acids, um, it'll tell me a little bit more about the quality of the prey. So if it if they are eating those butter sticks versus the um, potato chips. So I'm really butter. hoping to kind of look. Yeah, sorry, it's the best analogy <laughs> I could come up with. Yeah, but, um, I'm really hoping that that will um, help kind of check in and and look at a little bit more. The other cool thing that we've been doing with the um, the UME that's happening is we've been taking baleen samples. So mm -hmm. Mo Flannery showed the baleen. And what that does is it's actually growth from the animal for the last two to three years. And in it, there's isotopes that are in that. So you've actually got a, um, 
a carbon and nitrogen footprint of the species that that animal consumed during that time. So you can actually associate it back with this uh, specific prey type. So I'm hoping my research will kind of open the door to kind of link everything up and see what else we can learn. That's great. Um, And then, uh, you know, you showed a a diagram with like kind of all the different layers of, Mm -hmm. of blubber. Is there, when you're kind of, um, getting samples from maybe like very malnourished or skinny whales, is there anything that's like noticeably missing when you look at a blubber sample? Yeah, so um, at the necropsies and what we've been seeing within the UME is the blubber when you're cutting on it um, in a whale, it's it's um, it's really fibrous. So it usually mm-hmm. blubber should be kind of not spongy, but really slippery, really wet because it's just lipid. Just think of it like when you're, mm. um, if you have oil in a pan or something along those lines, it should be seeping out of it once you cut into it. But right now it's just really fibrous. So just think of it, mm. um, the pink that was shown in that slide is all the collagen fibers or everything that's holding the structure of the blubber together. And the fibers are now just more prominent than the adipocyte should be. And it really should be a really even match. Yeah, interesting. Um, and then is whale blubber anything like human fat or any other animals fat? Is there any correlation? So I, for humans, I'm not quite sure. I know we have, um, adipose tissue. We usually have different types of fat, but I'm, I can't speak fully to it. Mm -hmm. Um, whale blubber is, they've been doing a lot of, um, different studies between different cetaceans. So harbor porpoises, there's also been a lot of studies done on different pinniped species to look at the different blubbers, but a lot of them are a layer. There is always an inner and an outer layer, but that's because of the, they are marine mammals. They need to have that hydrodynamic shape. They need to be able to thermoregulate. So there's kind of a lot that goes into it that humans yeah. don't necessarily need. Maybe we did once upon a time, but not any longer because we have clothing. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. Um, and then uh, just a question about how, how do you fix and embed the fatty tissue for microscopy? Uh, so um, I only do the trimming um, at our place. So okay. it's essentially just doing a really thin cut, try not to cut your fingers off and fitting it into a cassette. And then it goes up to um, University of Davis for the embedding and the slicing there. They do all the work there. I, that's not my expertise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and, then, and then there's a couple of questions about just... Um, you know, with your job as an necropsy man, uh, manager. Um, so what has been the leading cause of cetacean deaths on the California coast um, from your time, uh, yeah, during your time conducting these and how has it changed over over time? So with large whale necropsies, mm-hmm. there's always a monkey's wrench that is thrown in and that, that wrench is decomposition. So this lovely blubber that I have been talking about is also yeah. the reason why animals, this animal decomposes so quickly because it does act as an insulating layer. So when an animal, when a whale dies, it it's still warm, right? It's warm internally. Mm-hmm. And then as the sun shines in on it, it warms up internally and that blubber keeps everything warm, allowing all the bacteria get excited, they grow, they cause a lot of decomposition. So we're not able to fully determine every single whale that we see as cause of death. So we've seen, we're, we've gotten really good with um, looking at human interaction causes. So whether it's an entanglement, a ship strike, um, a peduncle or a tail that's been cut off. Other areas are a little bit harder just because of decomposition. So histology doesn't real reveal a lot or the histopathology. And um, we're trying to, we're hopefully able to send off tissues for other like virology agents, anything along those lines. But it, it you, there's no leading cause one over the other. Mm. Um, certain seasons, there'll be more entanglements than others. Other seasons, there might be more ship strikes, but there's always an effort to work with um, different agencies to help alleviate some of those issues. Yeah. Um, and then, so what's what's the next, what's next for your research? What, what are you gonna do, you know, next week or next month? So uh, starting tomorrow, I have been uh, subsampling frozen blubber tissue. So just think of that meat that you have in the freezer or frozen something that you have in the freezer. 
And I've been taking a knife to it to cut it apart into small sections while it's still frozen because I don't want any of the cells to degrade and any of the lipid mm -hmm. to escape. So that's kind of the next um, steps. And then after that, we'll be looking at the total lipid content. And then further on down the line, I'll be working with um, a lab up in Nova Scotia to analyze the fatty acid content because they're um, experts in this and I'm not, and I wanna learn all I can. So quite a bit, there's always lots to do. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you so much um, for joining us. Um, I guess final question is, uh, will you come back to Nightlife and when you have all the answers to your questions and share them with us? By all okay. means, I would love to come back. I get all jazzed, it's so fun. You learn so much every time, it's just great. <laughs> Okay. Um, thanks so much. I'm going to um, bring back Lynn to close out the show. Night, Barbie. Sounds good. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hey, Lynn. Hello. Um, oh. Well, another thank you to Mo, Stephen, John, and Barbie. Um, and of course, thank you, everyone, for hanging on and staying with us for two hours and eight minutes. If you watch the full thing, um, next week, we are actually celebrating the one year anniversary of our first official virtual nightlife. Um, and we're gonna be bringing back our very first night school guest. Um, the Academy's own curator of botany, Natalie Nagalingam, um, is gonna return with a few botanist friends and they're gonna share tales of their adventures tracking down plants all over the world. Um, so it'll be a fun one, come back and join us um, for our one year. <laughs> Yeah, our baby's getting kind of big. <laughs> um, first birthday. Yeah, but uh, yes, thank you again so much, as Lynn said, for joining us. Um, you make our Thursday nights. You make our Thursday nights. And um, mm -hmm. so I always say this, please subscribe to our YouTube channel so you know that when, so you know when uh, night school is back um, and you don't miss an episode. Um, and so, and also the Academy is reopened. And I saw a few of you at the beginning say that you had visited already. Thank you so much. I hope, we hope you had a wonderful time. Um, but uh, Nightlife, we'll let you know when we're back in the building. We're not quite ready for that yet. Um, but until then, you know, night school's here. And if you're comfortable, if you're comfortable doing so, we have been closed for about a year. So. Um, we're still relying on generous donor support. There's a link in the YouTube description if um, you want to donate at all, but we just love seeing you here every week. So thank you for that support. Um, and with that, have a good night, everybody, and stay safe out there. Bye. Bye.